We have Timothy Barton, the president of Wall Builders International. We have Omer Eschel of The Bible Comes to Life. We have Court Weldon, my uh, child. <laughs> Thank y'all so much for being here. This is a dream that Sadie. It's a dream that Sadie and Court have had about us getting together and celebrating Shabbat and, and some of the feast. There's some things that God spoke to me, y'all, 30 years ago. And when he spoke these things to me, I said, what do I do with this? And we know that Mary hid some things in her heart that God spoke to her. And those are, there's some things that God spoke to me and told me that I had to hold it and hide it in my heart. And he's begun to allow me to release some of those things. And we're eating into a season. It is, it is my belief that God works in seasons. Summer, winter, spring, and fall, we know that. And I believe that the season we're in right now began in 2020. There's an uncovering, there's an uprooting, there's exposure that's taking place. And it's not just in our nation, it's in the church of the living God. And we've got to realize the way that we've always done business hasn't worked. And God says, never return to business as usual. And so I believe that God has called us to return to him. And when you study in the Bible, you'll find out that there'll be a 400 year periods that God will go silent and they didn't hear God speak. And then the people would begin to cry out to God and they would return to God. And the first thing they would do was they'd cleanse the temple and they'd restore the, and reestablish the feast. God has spoken and said we must return to him. We have no honor in our nation. We have no honor in our communities. We have no honor in our houses, in our homes, because we have not honored the creator of all. And he says we must return to him. And with the returning to him, We've got to cry out for the refiner's fire, the Holy Spirit, to come and reveal the things within us that are not pleasing to him. And he reveals those things. We allow him to remove those. You call out and you say, Father, I want all you got for me. Well, the refiner's fire is hell, will help bring it about. I gave you a scripture a while ago about Malachi, the last, very last verse in the, in the Old Testament of the Bible before he entered into John and to Jesus, it was a 400-year period from the time that he says, I'm going to return the hearts of the fathers to the children, the hearts of the children to the fathers. And that day began with John the Baptist, the foreteller. And it's been 400 years since our nation was founded. And so the Americans' God is calling us to return to God. And Sadie mentioned a while ago to return to original tent while God created man. We must return to him, and a part of returning to him is to reestablish the feast. I'm not talking about getting into a legalistic system, because if you want to return to, to all of the legalistic system under the old covenant, how many of y'all didn't go to church last Sunday? Do you know what happens to y'all? We got to stone you. You want to study on the law? We're not talking about getting under the law. We're talking about in Exodus 23, verse 14, Jesus said, there's three feasts that you have to return to me in Jerusalem. And the people all had to return on those three feasts every year. On the very first trip that we went to Israel, Omer took us to Mount Shiloh. We call it Shiloh, but he calls it Shiloh. And we went to Shiloh, and we stood on the mountain, and we looked where the Israelites would have camped. And the whole mountainside was covered with red clay pottery. And he said they would carry their, their pots and everything with them, with their food and everything. When they came to, in to, to, the, to the tabernacle, and as they'd come to the tabernacle, when they got ready to leave, they would bust all of their pottery. This mountain is covered with it. We have trouble with people leaving their peewee sport games on Sunday. We have trouble with them leaving anything to get together on a weeknight or a weekday, any time. And God said, y'all got to return to Jerusalem three times a year. Omer will tell you there's eight feasts that they actually celebrate in Israel. 
One of them being Shabbat every week that we just celebrated. We sit down with our family every Sunday and we have dinner around the table. And we pray and we talk about things and, and, and anybody that will come to my house and sit around my table will talk about the things of God. And we'll have a Shabbat dinner no matter what the day is because we celebrate it every day. But the reestablishment of the feast is why we asked Omer and Tim to come and, and to, to share about the feast. And so it's my heart, as the heart of a father, is we've got to restore that, re that reverence and that all for God. Because until the honor of God is returned, there's not going to be any honor in our nation. Because we're not, our reflection of how we honor one another is a direct correlation of our relationship with God and how we honor Him. Thank y'all very much. Y'all can clap and cheer for that. <laughs> and so for me, it's not about going into legalism or anything. It's about honoring God. He said these are perpetual feasts. And so what we do is we honor Him and we recognize on Passover that the death angel passed over because they put the blood of the lamb. We recognize Passover because the blood of the final blood atoning sacrifice was given for you and I with Jesus. We celebrate Pentecost because that's when the Holy Spirit came and he manifested his presence to each and every Man, woman, boy, and girl who would trust Christ. We celebrate tabernacles. Because Omer tells us that they had to have an opening so they could look in the sky. And they could see that God's the one that created that. So that's the Father's heart of this house. And that's why we're here. Jacob, Court, it's your turn. Uh, just speaking on original intent, one of the reasons we wanted to do this type of an event and be able to really express a love for Israel, uh, we know that there's so many churches and so many people in Christianity who have kind of written off the Old Testament. They've written off what it means to love our Jewish brothers and sisters. They don't have a heart for Israel because they don't understand why we should have a heart for Israel. And so that is a big big deal to us because we are grafted in. The original Christians, the original Christ followers were actually the Jews because Jesus came to the Jew first and Jesus came to fulfill the law. So we are set free from the law because of Jesus. Amen. But we are fortunate that he then said, go to the world. We're the rest of the world. We're the Gentiles who have now been grafted in to the same faith. Yes, we may not see everything the same, but Baptists and Catholics don't see everything the same. But we're still worshiping the same God. And so that's the intent behind this. Thank you guys so much again. I, I don't think we even uh, got the opportunity to, to express this, but the, the first year we did this, I was praying 50 people would show up. We had no idea. <laughs> we had no idea what was, what was gonna happen. And we were really fortunate last year that 96 people registered. Well. I'm proud to say that tonight we had 139 people register. That is huge. So thank you for that. It's, it's genuinely shows us that this is something that is so necessary and it's something that people genuinely want. Um, and, and, and for me, one of the things just coming back to the topic, which is God's original intent and returning to the feast and all of that. Um, we were at a conference a few weeks, I guess it's been about a month ago. It was in January. And we were really praying and interceding for some other pastors and some friends of ours. And, and the Lord showed me a vision of what's actually gone on in the church. And we know that it is for freedom's sake that Jesus set us free. Amen. We know that when he died and when the veil of the temple was torn, we were then able to enter into the fullness of everything God had for us. When Jesus said it is finished, he meant it's done. He meant there's nothing else separating you from entering into all that God has for you. But in this vision that the Lord showed me, he showed me that the veil itself, what was left of it was tattered and it was torn and it was moldy and it had holes. There was not much left of this veil. 
because it had not just been ripped in half, it had been completely obliterated. And see, what religion does is it tries to put that veil back up. Yep. So there are people in churches, there are people in different denominations who have taken on a mantle of religion and tried to put that veil of the temple back up. And so the burden that they feel is actually trying to hold on to something and try to separate themselves from entering in to the Holy of Holies. And so what it means to return to the original intent, what it means to honor the Father, what it means to step into all that he has for you, tear down the walls that you've put up between you and God. It said tear down all that veil because why are you doing that to yourself? He said, come in. His word says that if you draw near to me, I will draw near to you. And that's a promise that we can stand on. Amen. So for me, that was a huge revelation that the Lord showed me and gave me was that that veil, there's nothing left of it. So stop trying to put it back up. Amen. Amen. Okay. Now, what are the questions? Well, the, the thing is just for me, I was just going to have everybody talk about what it means to return to, to that original intent. What does it mean for like we're honoring the feast, we're honoring God, we're honoring fatherhood, we're honoring those things. So what, what does that look like for you guys? I, I think even the thought of why are the feasts important, yes. right? Because if you go back to Deuteronomy 6, uh, God told the Israelites through Moses that everything I've commanded you is for your good. Well, that means one of the things we know about the word of God is what God was telling the Israelites to do was actually for their benefit. It's interesting uh, there was a, a book done by a medical doctor who actually went back and said, if you look at even the dietary laws and restrictions God gave the Israelites, right, at a time when this was a very unheard of, unthought of practice anywhere in the world, they've, right, they've be, basically become Egyptians because they were in Egypt for 400 years and they've taken on the customs of Egypt and they come out and God's like, yeah, new thoughts, right? We're not just going to like eat animals like raw meat. Let's cook that a little bit first. And he goes through some basic things, right? Like, hey, let's not pick up and play with dead things. Things that for us were like, yes, unclean, unsanitary. God is giving them an idea and a standard for their own good and their benefit. And it's easy to look back sometimes and think, wait a second, we're grace, right? We're the covenant of grace. We don't have to follow those things. But God didn't give those to be restrictive. God gave many things for our good and our benefit. And one of the things that God gave was these feasts. And what's interesting about these feasts, right? Why did, why did God tell the Israelites, right? You're going to have this feast around Passover, Feast of Weeks. It was to remember what God had done. It, it was to remember who God was. And, and, and the Feast of First Fruits and, and what our responsibility and our duty is, these feasts were not something that was directly intended for the people of the Old Testament. It wasn't for, right, the Jews coming out of Egypt because as was already identified, the disciples kept all of these. The early church kept all of these things. Jesus kept all of them, encouraged his followers to keep all of them. And this is what's significant is it very much in my mind, and Omer, you can maybe direct this if I'm thinking about this incorrectly, but when, when even the Israelites cross over the, the Jordan, when they cross the Red Sea and God tells them, hey, you need to build an altar. And one of the things that's going to happen is your kids are going to come one day and say, why are there this pile of rocks? And you say, because this is when God showed up and did this event right here. That's part of what the feasts were about, to remember who God was and what God has done, which is, I, I so appreciated when you started and said one of the most important things, right? That God wants us as leaders of our home to bless our family. And, and as we bless our family, that's a blessing to God. This is very similar in my mind to this notion of even the feast is that God wanted it to be a blessing for us. But part of the blessing for us was acknowledging and recognizing who he is and what he has done, which every time we get together in church and we're going to sing songs, well, there's only two reasons that you praise and worship God for who he is and what he's done. That's right. What the feasts were about is remembering who God is and what he's and done. What he's done. That's good too. And this is where today it's easy to go, you know what, but that's Old Testament. We're New Testament people. We're grace people. How silly would it be to say, you know what, Ten Commandments, that's so Old Testament. We disregard that. That would be stupid, right? Like, that's ridiculous. This is the exact same notion as disregarding some of these ideas of the feast, because if we say we don't need to any longer remember who God is and what he has done— then we've lost the point of the life we've been called to live, who God wants to be in our life, how we're supposed to lead in our families and our friends and our jobs. And so part of the idea of even returning to original intent 
The idea of the feast was to remember who God was and what he had done, but specifically to have a dedicated time every single year. It's always on the calendar. Yeah. No. So it wasn't like, man, I just forgot this weekend. Nope. You will always remember this because this is part of your everyday routine. This is part of every year. This is what we are doing. And it was that level of intentionality that helped the Israelite people, the early Christians, to keep their eyes focused on the right thing, who God is and what he's done. Amen. First Corinthians, Paul said, these things happen as examples for yes. you. Right. That you shouldn't do some of these things, but these others were for you to continue to do for examples. You know, it's funny that we look today, 2,000 years, 3,000 years, uh, and we look at the Old Testament and the New Testament, and we know how the story ends, right? Those yes. of you who have been with us in Israel, we keep on telling you guys, it's not fair. You know how the story ends. Back then, when they got out of, out of Egypt and they sat down in Pentecost, well, you know, there were two times that the Holy Spirit came down, came down to the earth, in Pentecost and in Shavuot, in the Old Testament. That was when the children of Israel sat down by the Sinai uh, uh, mountain, and when Moses went up to the, to the mountain, that was Pentecost. All right, so that's a prefiguration. Now, when we read at the Ten Commandments, and we say, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to piggyback on what, what Tim said, about the, the laws that these guys just came out of Egypt, right? And they said, thy shall not kill. Now, for us, it's obvious, thy shall not kill. Why is it obvious? Because we grew up on those values given to us by God. Yeah. These people, 3,000 years ago, our ancestors were not the same values. Yeah. They had to be dictated, and they had to be told by God, thy shall not kill. Thy shall not covenant. You know, this is, these are things that what built us as a Western society. And I gotta, I gotta share this with you. This, it's an understanding that I had when I was doing uh, 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 a lot of work for the Israeli government in China. One of the reasons why it's so hard for Westerners to work with the East is because they don't have the Ten Commandments. Yeah. Think about it. Yes. They don't have the same base as we do. They don't have the Beatitude. It's the same base. So what God is giving to us on the feast, you're not going to ask people, what is the feast? I'm going to tell you it's a big meal. No, it's not. It's not a big meal. The idea of a, there's definitely a meal involved, but that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's on the side. The feasts are God's way to give us a basically calendar. He breaks out the year and he tells you, you should do A, B, C. And he actually says that. That is what I want you to do. The idea is that once we do that, we remember who is our father. And when we do that, we give respect to our father. And if you look at the Ten Commandments, the fifth command, okay, the fifth command, it says, honor thy father and thy mother. And if you look at the structure of the Ten Commandments, is the first five is going to be between men to God, and the other five will be between men to men. And let me clarify, because in the more Americanized version of Christianity, our Ten Commandments are numbered a little differently. So the first four mm -hmm. are really the dynamic we would see toward God. Yeah. And the last six we would see as relationship to man. Uh -huh. So what would, what would you consider then the first five? What are we, where do we number that differently? No, it's the you? same. It's the same. But I tell the difference. Okay. The fifth command, honor the father and thy mother, that's the shift between men, men to God to men to men. Because if you honor your father and your mother, you also honor your father up in heaven. Right. So two fathers. Yes. No. Yes. No. So the main idea, by the way, folks, of why we have this panel, the best way, I think, or the funnest way to learn is to ask questions. And we encourage people to ask questions, and there's no such thing as a dumb question. It does not exist. Okay? Any question is a good question. And if we're going get, to get a debate, even better. And I'll tell you... I disagree. Uh, ah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. When you see people debating about the Bible, and in Israel you'll see it every single Shabbat. We debate. We're actually getting loud about this. The end of the day, though, and this is something that, that and I know it's not an American thing. If you debate, you don't want to disrespect the person in front of you. That's not the case. Because when we debate, we all agree that what the Bible says is 100% correct. That's yes. the foundation of all of it. Yeah. Everything around it, play along. That's fine. You're trying to find a way to understand it. But once you have that foundation, 
you actually don't really debate. You shop in the minds of each other. No. So let's shop the minds of each other. Questions? No, we'll, we'll have a time of Q&A. Ah, end. sorry, no. Oh, um, I disagree. I disagree. Yes, I disagree. <laughs> I'm just going to, I'm going to pivot for you. Uh, but that, yes. That was uh, a great segue. I like it. It was good. But... Uh, I will say this, though. Uh, in one of the conversations we had with Omer earlier, um, inviting children to ask those questions, um, especially when we, because we are going to try to do some events this year for the feasts. We're going to introduce them this year and do it in a way that if you will come at it with childlike faith, if you will come at it with childlike questions, and like he said, there is no wrong question. That's the beauty of the relationship that God wants to have with all of us. Because that inquisitive mind, I think in some form or another, that's squished in us in public education because basically you're taught take this test. Everybody be quiet. It's, Write this down. It's going to be the test. Just listen to what I say. Right. And so in a lot of ways, especially in our Americanized version of education, our Americanized version of the Bible, we think it's disrespectful, like he said, to ask those questions. Um, but I think one of the true testaments that I've seen in getting to know Omer and his family is the way that he does Shabbat and the way that he educates his daughters. He has two children, both of his daughters. They're 10 and 5, is that right? Seven. 10 and 7. Okay. Yeah, that's right. It's been two years. Yeah. Wow. Um, they both, they both got that. older. I did not, but they did. It's great. <laughs> so, <laughs> but in, in watching how he interacts with these girls, uh, he takes them to the places of the Bible and he opens it every Shabbat. He opens the Bible at a biblical location and he shares the word of God with them. It's something that I wish we could have that in the States, but we can in a spiritual manner yeah. because you can sit down with your children yeah. at least once a week. You should be doing it daily, but you can at least once a week dedicate to sit down with your kids open the Bible and say, let's talk about it. What questions do you have? Let's talk about this Bible scripture. And I will say this, my mother did this with us. And that is the reason that we're able to do what we do. That's the reason I'm here. That's the reason my family looks the way that it does is because my parents were adamant about teaching us the word of God. And dad will tell you this. He's the first one to tell you this. We're not special. You can do this, I promise. I'm watching my brothers do it with their kids as they're doing it. I know Tim is doing it with his daughters. Uh, it's something that we have to take ownership of, uh, especially because it's an honoring of the Father, our Father God. And so in a lot of ways, when we're not doing our due diligence to train one another, to love one another, to ask these questions, we're not honoring God the Father. But I mean, that's the beauty that I've seen in Shabbat, and in going back to the original intent of why we need to celebrate the feast, is it's, if we can come at it with the curiosity of a child, that was the beauty in that conversation we had this week. Let me give you something from the heart of a father. Whenever you start talking about the critical thinking, and Tim and David are the first to tell you that we've lost a lot of critical thinking in the United States. Uh, David wrote a book called Original Intent because we're forgetting our history. We're trying to erase our history. And... and David will tell you that if you forget your history, you're liable to repeat it. And so we want to know our history. But the, the critical thinking is not there. Okay, but they're all sitting here tonight. There's a lot of y'all men that are my age, and all of a sudden you think, man, I didn't train my children like that. Oh, wow, I haven't been teaching my, my grandchildren like that. So the first thing that I'll tell you that the enemy does is he tries to bring guilt and condemnation on you. Okay, but Romans 8, 1, Paul said, there is therefore to now, right now, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh. So if you're feeling any condemnation of, wow, I wish I would have done this or I'd done that, well, what you do is, is you receive what God says. You're under the blood of Jesus. There's do-overs in the kingdom of God. And, and we begin from this point doing better. We begin from this point, husbands honoring your wives, husbands honoring your children and grandchildren. We start over, and we begin to do the best that we can. It's like eating that proverbial elephant. My old pappy told me, one bite at a time. And so you all got to start somewhere, but don't allow the enemy to put guilt and condemnation on you because you hadn't, okay? It, it, it's not from God. Any condemnation you feel is, is straight from the pits of hell. So God is about drawing you to him and helping you recognize that we need to do some changing and we need to change some things. 
And so that's what this is all about, is recognizing. Let's return to original intent of why God created mankind. And let's return to original intent in our nation. Why was our nation formed? Let's return. And that's what I believe that we're at. That's the place that we're at in history right now, is we must return. Thanks for watching. We know you'll be blessed by this week's message. Be sure to subscribe to our channel and click the bell so you're notified as soon as we post a new video. For more information about our church and ways you can get involved, visit cmjacksboro.com. Thanks for joining us and welcome home.